Now, where did I put them? Hmm. Ah, here it is. Welcome to the Toolbox, where we discuss the tools we utilize every day. Yours to use or toss, it's up to you. But I hope you enjoy. Hey everybody, before we get to the show, just want to uh, give a shout out to my Breacher teams. They are Corey Hiker uh, and the, Pan the Pantway Podcast. I uh, can't thank you guys enough for supporting me and keeping this show moving forward. If anybody out there wants to get involved and uh, become one of my Breacher teams or help out in any way, head on over to my Patreon page at uh, www.patreon.com slash tools for the toolbox. And without any further ado, we'll get right to the show. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to episode four of Tools for the Toolbox. We have a fantastic guest for you who uh, I heard first heard on uh, the Jocko podcast, but I'm going to let him introduce himself. So let's kick it off with who are you and what is your military background? Well, I appreciate the opportunity. My name is Joel Struthers. I'm a proud Canadian and I served six years in the Canadian, or sorry, two years in the Canadian militia and then went on and served six years in the uh, Airborne Regiment with the French Foreign Legion, the Deuxième Regiment Etranger Parachutiste. And within those, I did four years with their Pathfinders, which is the GCP, the Group Commando Parachutiste. And uh, yeah, I got out in 2000, returned to Canada. And today I'm a commercial helicopter pilot and a partner in a Canadian uh, risk mitigation company. Right. So as a helicopter pilot, that, that runs out of a different licensing system than like airline correct or like uh, true. A I mean, fixed well, wings? yeah it's it's under transport canada but it's mm -hmm. a different license it's obviously a rotary uh helicopter license commercial uh we fall under the same rules and regulations but it's a totally different uh, industry uh there's not a lot of similarities in yeah our job mm -hmm. description and tasks how how long before like did you get out fly back to canada and then just go to school for your license or did you already have flying experience for that or how did that no, work? Um, so we were in the helicopters all the time, obviously in the in the rep. Uh, they have the super or the Puma, Super Phalons, and we used to uh, halo jump out of the uh, both. So we we're always I was always watching the pilots, kind of enamored with the uh, the job that they were doing. And in my last year in the Legion, I had reached out to um, Vancouver Island Helicopters VIH on Victoria Island, or Vancouver mm -hmm. Island, and applied to their training school. Nice, and I was accepted. And so when I got out, and that was the big reasoning for my uh, leaving the Legion, I got out and I was in the training program, I think within a month of my return to Canada. Oh, wow. And uh, straight into, I knew nothing about the commercial helicopter world. I just knew I wanted to fly or, or try it. And uh, yeah, I kind of got thrown to the wolves and <laughs> here we are, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, that's one hell of a transition. Like you're going from not only uh, physical transition, right? You're changing countries yeah you're changing languages and you're changing job titles how was that transition as a whole it sounds like a shit show you know you're right it was a shit show at the time i didn't realize mm -hmm. uh, but looking back and thinking on it um it was definitely a challenge i think being in the city world was different as you can imagine um and experience yourself so you don't have the, the kind of the structure the discipline and the timing so you're kind of left to your own devices so you got to but you have that training, so you're a little more um, adjusted and, and on dialed in, if you, you know what I mean. But mm -hmm. uh, I think learning to enjoy the time off is a challenge. I found the, the school aspect of the training challenging because we were used to being outside, physical activity, you know, burn off energy. Mm -hmm. Whereas now you're stuck in a class trying to soak up numbers and math, and math was never my strong point. Um, that being said, I was interested in it, so I just I made it happen. But uh, I think going back, if I was to do it again, I could probably, you know, um, learn more from those six months of training had I been, you know, out more. Yeah, yeah. I found, um, you know, even when I was in, you go on like a lead block, and the first week you're like, oh, thank God, I don't have to work, and you grow your beard, and then you're like, okay, sweet. Second week, you're like you know, this is starting to get itchy and I kind of want to do something. And by the third week, you're just like, let me get the fuck back to work. Like I, <laughs> I can't handle the time off. And uh, when I went to school, it was the same thing. It was, uh, I showed up and I was like, okay, we get started at 0700. All right, let's get them. And you're like at the door five minutes ahead of time waiting in line. And the teacher shows up three or four minutes late and the <laughs> students kind of file in over the next 15 minutes. And I was sitting, I was just like, yeah, good. What? 
And I think I hear, I hear you 100%. And I think with our military background, you're always training for something like it's a, it's a, a process in your final objective, you know, so it's this is training school, but next I need to get a job, I need to figure out this skill. Mm -hmm. So you're not really relaxed and enjoying the moment. You're just kind of like, I got to get this done. And, you know, so where's your, your typical skill? You're kind of just having a blast and enjoying the moment, you know? So yeah. um, I don't know if I regret that, but it just, it is what it is. You know, you're, yeah. you're a different type of person. Yeah. It, it's a really, it's a tough trend. School going from military to school is challenging. I mean, flight school is a much more technical. I went to an, I went into an equine science program. So I was surrounded by 19 year old girls talking about horses yeah. and that was, um, Interesting. So, <laughs> I, remember, I remember telling my instructor, if he got frustrated with me, you know, if I wasn't listening or, or doing what he was wanting and he would verbally try to explain it, but I'm just coming from the Legion. I was like, you know what, just hit me yep. and I will, you know, give me a good shoulder and then <laughs> it will work. You know, and that was the Legion stuff. You know, it's like, you're not paying attention to other smack, you know? And, yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. Smart the fuck up. Let's go. Let's, exactly. get, let's, let's move on. Yeah. It, it took him a while for him to, uh, to adapt to that request. Well, you know, Canadians aren't really known for just smacking people upside the head either as, as a whole, like as a culture, I just was, uh, I, I think we could use it though. Right about oh, that. there's a few people I'd like to give a couple yeah. smacks to. Um, but I, you know, I talked to uh, a couple of my buddies who are Americans, uh, on my last podcast and I was like, you know, the biggest difference is like the average Canadian and the average American, the average American will come to blows a bit quicker than the average Canadian will. And even just like a quick fist fight. And I think, um, I don't know too many French people, but they seem like they would. <laughs> what do you, you think that's an accurate assessment or? Um, well, yeah, certainly. Um, I think, you know, as Canadians, we have our manners are up there on, on the chart of, you mm -hmm. know, one to 10. Um, but then once we surpass those, I think we're, we're, we're apt at, you know, sticking up for ourselves or making a yeah. point. Um, as for the French, yeah, I think, you know, similar, they're a little more reserved, mm. um, but they can, they can get hot um, for sure. And it depends on, you know, the background of the, the Frenchman too. You know, there's a, it's a that makes sense. culturally diverse country. Um, yeah. And, you know, I kind of get into that in the book. There's some, some issues where I got into myself into trouble and situations, but uh yeah, I think it comes down to an individual too, whatever your yep. temperament is and what oh. you accept as, you know. For sure. Now, for for transition wise, if you had the ability, I talked, I asked this of everybody, but um, if you had the ability to go back and talk to yourself right now with what you know and where you what you've done, and in the midst of your transition, like you're just arriving back in Canada, yep. what would you tell yourself? How would you make that easier on yourself? Uh, I think the first thing I would say is slow down, mm. Just, you know, breathe, look around and then try to, you know, focus a little more on the day-to-day -day tasks and not be too downrange, you know, mm -hmm. trying to jump um, some of the different blocks of, of training or, or, or your life. Um, but I think that comes with youth too and age, you know, as you get older, you, you start to chill out a little more and, and, and see your strengths and weaknesses and then try to, you know, adapt accordingly. Um, and then, yeah, try to enjoy it more. I mean, as you, you know, as you get older, time just flies. You've got these great opportunities. I mean, we're very fortunate as Canadians and, uh, you know, don't sweat the small stuff. We seem to get all, you know, fixated on the, on the BS, but really in the big picture, it's, it means nothing. And you're just kind of ruining your own ride. Man. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the ability to slow down and look, is so important and uh one of the few things we always do when we're looking at like munitions disposal is you have to walk up onto say uh, an old piece of ordnance like a artillery shell or something like that and then you have to stop you have to look at it and then you have to recce the area you have to take the time to really assess what you're going at because you could just look at it and say oh yeah it's just an artillery shell i'm going to walk up put a block c4 on it blow it up yeah. but you don't know if that thing has if like if pieces have come off it is there high explosive in the area is there an impact crater is there not is it underground is it above ground like there's so many aspects to it and when you put that into your everyday life right that the ability to just stop and go okay whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah. let's just take a second 
it's that simple. All you got to do is take a second and really, you know, assess what you're doing here. Um, and that kind of brings us into what I wanted to talk about anyway, which is risk. So leaving, let's just say, you know, entering the military in any form is a risk, right? It is your signing a dotted line that says my life for my country, right? Period across the board. But then going to a different country, <laughs> joining their military and signing a line that we're going to put my life on for theirs. That's a whole another side of risk that you are yeah. actively, I can't even say looking for a fight, but you're, um, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. But yeah. Yeah. a lot of people look at risk as bad, just in general, like they don't want to take their risk adverse, I would say, the average person. Do you think risk is good or bad per se? Or is just, what do you think? I think risk is, is what it is. Um, it's how you look at it and deal with it and whether or not you're comfortable, you know, jumping into that risk or, or seeing what you can gain from it. Um, you know, you mentioned obviously me going over to another country and signing up with their military. Uh, as a young man, I think we're, we're more prone to taking risks. We don't necessarily maybe know the, the potential outcomes or the risks. Um, we're just, you know, young and full of vinegar and ready to go out there and prove ourselves and all, or figure ourselves out. Right. And for whatever reason I was, hell bent on soldiering. It wasn't really an option back in, in the nineties with the Canadian military. It was, a, it was yep. a tough time for them. And that was a door that was open to me. And uh, yeah, to be honest with you, I didn't think it out too, too much. Uh, I had looked into the American military, same thing that would have taken too long. And I just, I just went for it. Um, and then, you know, for me, obviously everyone's different, but it, it worked in my favor. I learned, you know, to navigate those risks. I learned a lot about myself. And then with that experience, down the road, I was able to kind of maybe understand risks and, and deal with and circumnavigate better. Um, you know, after the military, I spent quite a lot of time in Iraq and Afghanistan as a, a civilian contractor. And my attitude and views on things progressed and changed with more time in those environments. And uh, to this day, you know, I think, especially with flying, there's, a, there's inherent risks. Um, as you get older, you're a little less prone to, to push the limits. If that yeah. makes sense. You know, and there's, there's something, there's something to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I, I know that answer your question kind of comes down to the individual and what their, their comfort levels are, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it evolves as well because you're based on your experience, because when I first got to Afghanistan, my version of risk was not the same as when I left. There were, you know, first couple of days I was, I was searching everything. Didn't matter what it was. Like I, I would spend extra time just making sure that something wasn't uh, an IED. And by the end of the tour, I mean, I knew the ground pretty well. And if I, you know, my assessment of risk was like, no, I'm good with that. And you're it, the, go ahead. Yeah, no, sorry, not to cut you off. Yeah, agreed. I, I think as you ex experience, I think it's 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 interesting how humans can adapt and just learn to survive in their environments and in combat zones same thing you first show up and your head's on a swivel everything is a risk mm -hmm. you don't know what your gut's telling you you don't know what to and then over time it's like you take in all that data and you start to go you know what i you know i feel a risk or this feels comfortable to me and generally you're right i think it's amazing how the body can can pick up on certain things and then you're you're more apt at you know seeing the the red flags and yep. then and then you're you're also less stressed and that's a that's a big part of risk is stress and that has an effect on the on the human body and your mind and how you you act or behave and then as you're less stressed you do your job better um, absolutely and, yeah so it's you know i was always quite that was an interesting aspect of you know combat and then war zones and then just conflict in general or even you know humanitarian type things is, is seeing the behavioral uh side of humans and how people react and then also yourself you know what you become comfortable with um yeah, yeah it's uh yeah, it's definitely a learning experience i find the um the, the really interesting thing for me was i was reading the book on combat by uh Sir colonel dave grossman while i was in afghanistan and uh, the few times we got into straight up fights you know you, i was reading the portions on like what happens in a gunfight and i was just like oh shit like <laughs> Okay. And it, it helped me understand and utilize those uh, happenstances, the things that your body just does yeah. 
just by knowing it, right? And you could, being in a gunfight is, you know, that is the epitome of risk at this point, right? Other people are trying to kill you <laughs> and you're trying to kill other people. But there are certain aspects of it that you can utilize to your advantage. And like I was a machine gunner, I know people are going to target machine gunners. That's just the way it is, right? <laughs> so I can use that to my advantage by finding a really good position, getting into a really strong uh, uh, fire, fire base, like... Uh, I'm trying to remember the first one I got into, I found this great wall that was about four and a half feet, maybe five feet tall. My bipod fit on it perfectly so that I was in maybe like a quarter squat on the gun and I had great range of motion, but I was protected by this wall. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like the perfect machine gunner spot in, in ideally. Right. And I'm yeah. a pretty tall guy. So, uh, I was looking at it. This was not a very risk, uh, high risk area. So I was able to pour more fire onto the enemy because I wasn't worried about what was happening to me. And, uh, but that's a, it's a great point because it's, it's a personal, very personal relationship, right? Like how you deal with risk versus how I deal with risk. So two very separate things and based on our experiences, et cetera, et cetera. But how, how did you, how did that develop that your, your, experience with risk especially in some of the more uh <laughs> less fortunate areas of the country because or not country but uh of the world because you know as soldiers we don't get sent to the great spots right you don't get uh postings to or uh you don't go to war zones that are around like fiji or hawaii right? <laughs> you go to like exactly. you go to the worst spots but i had to do a four-month tour in ibiza yeah. Um, I think, you know, part of, part, to answer part of your question is, you know, as young soldiers, you're obviously training to learn how to soldier. And the final objective is to get into a, a situation where you're yeah. going to test your skills and your ability, but you never know how you're going to react until you get there. Um, you have preconceived ideas on how you're going to be in a combat situation, in a gunfight, a contact, whatever, but it doesn't always pan out that way. Uh, and then also your peers that are around you, you know, it's the guy that's all tough and talks up a great show. He's the one that freezes. It's that quiet one that doesn't say much that, you know, saves the day and yeah. you're in the, in the situation. So I was, and then when you get there, you learn things about yourself that aren't necessarily all positive. Right. And then you gain from that. You go, you know what? I was weak in this scenario or in this situation, or I didn't act accordingly here. And then you have the ability to, work on that when you're training, or you can think about it for the next, whatever period of time is. And then the next one, you know, you, you improve your game and you, you up your, your marksmanship or your soldiering to, to support your colleagues or your teammates around you. Um, I think in my scenario with being in Africa as a young Canadian, you know, who's very fortunate to grow up in a, in a privileged type country and, and setting family, you know, I had all the opportunities that mm -hmm. were, ordered to me on my plate. Um, here I am now in Africa in a civil war scenario. So not only is the terrain, the smells, the people, the, the architecture, the land different, I'm also being now thrown into my first, you know, firefight. Um, so it was, a, it was a lot to, to grasp, Yeah. Um, but I was fortunate. And I like, like all militaries and, and use sections, whatever you're in, you have the individuals that are your team that are more experienced and have been there before. And you basically just watch and learn. And that's what I try to do. And even to this day in my flying career, you know, I, I certainly don't have, I don't know it all. Uh, so as a young soldier, I certainly didn't know anything. So I just watched my teammates and followed their lead and tried to take what I could and soak up the information as best I can and just do what I was told to do and take criticism. You know, don't, yeah. you know, get all bent out of shape because you, excuse me, I'll be allowed to sort of fuck up. Um, just because we all do, right? That's that never, just learn from it. And then, yeah, next time you're, you're better. And that's to this day of flying, you know, I'm, I'm still every day challenged by it and I got to take it on the chin sometimes and just, yeah. and fix it. Yeah. So, you know, that's a really great benefit to, to recognize that because especially at a young age, I mean, when I was, you know, 24, 25, and I'd just gotten in, we, or when I, just gotten back from overseas. I think it was 25. Yeah. Just about turned 26. I thought I knew fucking everything. 
right? <laughs> you, you know, as a 20 year old, you're like, I'm fucking, I just went to war. I came back. I know the fuck I'm doing. You guys don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Right. And I made a lot of mistakes and I didn't take the criticisms that I should have. And I didn't understand um, that others were trying to teach me rather than I looked at it as just a negative thing. Yeah. But that's a, the ability to take criticism is a risk. You have to be open and vulnerable to uh, what is happening around you and what people are telling you. And being able to absorb that information is uh, such an important lesson to learn. <laughs> if you can learn it early. Fuck. And I think, oh, right? I hear you 100%. And I think we also, we learn and we get good at hopefully at finding the individuals out there in our line of work or in life in general that we're willing to take criticism from, you know, like you young soldier, you go into a, a section unit, whatever, and you kind of see the either your know, junior ranks NCO or an officer, you're like, you know what, that, that to me looks like a, a real soldier. He acts and behaves and on the ground. He, he leads by example. He's not talking shit and he's, you know, he's more fit than I am. And you kind of try to follow that lead. And if he tells you something, I don't think your, your ego doesn't, you're just like, you know what? Yeah, I'll, you're right. I'll listen yeah. and I'll, I'll learn, you know, on the other side, you know, the, the ones that are trying to teach you all the time, but they don't know shit. They're the ones you're like, you know, and I think figuring that out is, is, is important, you know? Um, and then that was, for me, was always a case is kind of finding that, that example and then trying yeah. to, to emulate some of their, their skills and aptitudes, you know? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I didn't understand that uh, having a mentor was, uh, it could be one way right? Like you can just have a mentor and look at somebody as that is my, uh, the person that I want to, uh, emulate and just do that. And at the time I didn't realize that And once I've got older and once I started real, I, uh, when I was a master corporal and I was an instructor, I realized that that as an instructor, that's what it is, right? That your recruits are looking at you as the example okay. period. And if you do not hold the, uh, the example, then they will follow that. And it, uh, it unfortunately, or fortunately, it affected me immediately when I got there. Whereas prior, when I was an instructor, I was just part of the unit. I didn't look at it as a, uh, I made the mistake of emulating the wrong people. Let's put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, I think the, teaching is a tough vocation. It's not for, it's not for everyone. You learn as you, as you experience, but you learn a lot about yourself or you learn about some of your your faults or failures that aren't working to your benefit as, as you mentioned you know that's it's a tough one i'm not i'm not cut out for training i've learned that early on yeah i don't have patience for it and uh it is what it is that's another thing too is you gotta you gotta learn your your <laughs> skill set right stay in your lane right if you can yeah. stay in your lane in life it's probably easier if you yeah. start absolutely you know that's um this is part of it as an instructor the big thing that i uh i really enjoyed about it was the aha moments where oh, i called them the aha moments when someone would grasp the concept, not just like what I was teaching them right now, but they could actually gather <laughs> the, you know, when I was teaching um, machine gun theory, right. To we're going over the C9 and all the, the basics for uh, the recruits. And I could just see one of them, like, oh, like <laughs> ding, the light went on the head. I'm like that. That's what I, that's what I loved about it. And, uh, and really it comes down to, putting it like putting your, uh, your will into something, right? You find something you really enjoy that that's what I like. That's what I'm going to do. And then putting your whole soul, your whole body into it. Yeah. And, you know, I wanted to be a soldier since I was, man, I got a picture of me when I was like four wearing a olive drab army cheap, like yeah. sweater. Right. And, uh, I wanted to be a soldier since I was little. And now that I'm, and then I, you know, you put your life on the line. That's the, the ultimate, expression of how much you want to do something right but you can do that for really any goal right like if you want something yep. you can just go after it and i've i've struggled over time of trying to figure out how to tell people that without sounding like an asshole right <laughs> yep. go go do what you want man just figure something out and go after it what do you think do you have any uh thoughts or have you tried to tell anybody else on how to do how to do that without being a dickhead about it? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, being a dad, you know, dad ops is tough. That's you're a training master corporal for for a long time. You know, what I mean, you're, um, and then, you know, 
some people don't want to take advice and yeah. it's how, you know, it's how you get that across. So to answer your question is, um, the one thing I try to instill them or, or share with them is you got to, no one's going to do it for you. No one's going to give you the secrets or the, you know, the, the, the shortcuts you got to do the work, but you got to believe in it first as a person, an individual, if you want something, you know, especially as young Canadians, you can do whatever you want in this country, basically. Um, so, but you have to want it and you have to put in the time and effort and you got to just don't listen to people because everyone out there is, you know, there's lots of negatives out there where they're trying to, mm -hmm. oh, you can't do that or whatever. You just got to put your head down and, and, and soldier on per se, you know? Um, I think that's, that's a tough one as young humans to pick up on or learn or understand, you know, it takes, it's not it's later in life where you're like, you know what, I'm, I control my, my destiny to, to a certain extent. Um, and it's all mental, right? If I'm, I'm on it and I'm focused, I, I can get it done. But if you start to listen to the naysayers or, or whatever, or, or overthink it and you think it's all, oh, it's too much work, you'll never, you'll never get there. So um, if I run into, you know, young, young people in, in the, in the work that I do or whatever, and they're, talking about that kind of stuff or I just say, you know, fucking just go after it, man. Just, you know, and it's better to regret something you have done than you have. I mean, it might not work, but at least you tried. Yeah. One of these days, all of us are going to be in our deathbeds, you know, um, thinking about our life and you're going to think, shit, man, I should have, you know, why didn't I try to do that? Yeah. Because I'm afraid to fail or someone told me you couldn't like that's worst case scenario. I mean, might as well say much rather say, Hey, I tried to give my all and it didn't work out, but Hey, it was a hell of a, yeah. And you know, you get stuff from it, right? Like it's, it's not a, uh, even if you fail, you try something big and you fail. Well, you got a shit ton of experience out of it. You got all kinds of lessons if you're ready to listen to them. And, uh, you've been, you've been given a lot more than what most people think. And, uh, I remember when I was in my, I think it was basic training here in Canada, which is not as intense as a lot of other basic training places, but I remember one of the, um, instructors asking me, he went around while we were doing pushups or something like that. And he was just like, what do you want to be? What do you want to be? And he was like asking for the trades of what people wanted to do. And he came up to me and he's like, what do you want to be? And I was like, I am going to be a combat engineer. That's right, and like it, it kind of tweaked him a little bit, but he was like, yeah. you're right. Cool, man. And he, and he just walked off. Whereas other people, he would be like, oh, you think you're good enough to be blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's, on. Good on him, yeah. yeah, it's that uh, I remember being a, as an instructor when I uh, when I was talking to recruits, I would do the same thing. And if they had that sort of mentality where I'm just this is happening, there's like, it's not a, it's not a question of want. This is where I'm going. Uh, that is, I think it's key to to be able to really uh, follow through with a goal, right? Yeah. Because I think one of the hardest things, especially for my I got two young boys and they don't have the foresight to be able to look into the future and say, this will be worth it. Right. <laughs> we'll be sitting there doing homework or whatever and be like, dad, I don't, I don't know what this, the answer is to this. I'm like, okay, well let's work through it and I'll try and lead him to an answer. And you know, as a seven year old boy, he'll just be like, bah, I can't, I don't know how to do this. Right. I can't do it. And I'm like, can't you like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. can't you? Yeah. Um, you open yourself way too quick when you're young. Yeah. Uh, Another thing too, I think we, which is a hindrance in, in a lot of things in life and success is we're worried about what other people think. You know, we don't try things because if we fail, we, it could be an embarrassment or people might look down on me, but nobody cares, man. You just gotta, you know what I mean? And then once you do, you know, and that takes a long time. I mean, yeah. that's another thing I could go, if I could go back to myself back when I was young, I would say like, don't worry about other people's ideas or thoughts, you know, especially if they're not important in your life, you know, um, and that's another thing too, is trying to, to gauge who, who you care about, you know, people's reactions and stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, you know, my son's uh, 15 um, and same thing, you know, the, the long game is trying to make them understand what, you know, it's such, it's such an important age too, you know, that that triangle starts to get tighter towards the end. And when you start yeah. losing out on options and you gotta, you gotta go hard yeah. and fast early on, you know, if you want to, attain that uh, that tip yeah. anyway that's a you know one of the one of the hardest things to do is know when no one to cut bait yeah. right like when to when do you push through when do you just keep fucking going when do you smash through the wall when do you or yeah. when you go okay you know what 
I, I, I've bit. gone as far as I can. Either I need to adjust or I need to move on. Where do you think that uh, for yourself, how did you come to that point where you were like, you know what, maybe, uh, maybe being a Pathfinder is not where I want to be right now. Like, I mean, for me, when I left my, uh, the military, it was, it came to a head. My son had just been born. Uh, I knew I wasn't getting another tour and my next posting was going to be in Ontario, like to Petawawa. And I was like, yeah, yeah I don't really want to do this anymore. Yeah. Didn't really, I, I still love the army. I still love being an engineer, but I knew that that was not where I wanted to go. How for yourself, what was it that like, you're like, okay, time cut bait where I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah. I think uh, for me, you know, unfortunately the time I was in, we didn't have the, the Afghanistan period. So I didn't, you know, all my time was Africa per se. Mm -hmm. So a different environment, different type of comment. So I never really had the ultimate test that I was always kind of looking after or looking for um, per se. And at six years, I was 29 coming on 30. And you start to look at your peers because at that point I would need to, you know, choose whether or not I was going to stay and become an NCO. And then the Legion, you need 15 years for your, um, to take uh, your, you know, retirement. Right, pension, yeah. Uh, pension, sorry. Um, so I was looking at my, my, my colleagues, what they were doing. It was somewhat repetitive in that we were kind of going through that, the same pipeline, you know, the same courses and stuff. And I thought, you know what, uh, you know, the, the helicopter thing was just always in my mind and that's something I wanted to do. And I was, you know, I'm in the, I'm in France, I'm in the French colonies, but I'm always Canadian. So yeah. I'm not home. I'm always a guest in their army and their country. Um, so I always had this, this plan to return, take what I can from my experience at an age where, you know, it, it works for me. And then it's not too late where I'm, you know, stuck in the system and I can't really do much else. So that for me was the cut bait period. Now, mm -hmm. But Afghanistan kicked off when I was in and we started, you know, or Mali, you know, they've been in Mali now for, yeah. for um, I would have stuck it out because then I would have, you know, got to do, we never got to do an operational free fall jump. The guys mm. in the team they had like dozen plus under their belt, you know, that would have been a dream for us at the time. So it's just, I think it's trying to figure out what you want out of something. And then if you've attained it, you know, good for you. And also whether or not you gave it your all, you know, I, in my six years, I worked hard. I put in the time and effort. I got to the place where I got, which was, you know, fortunate. I was very, I was lucky. Um, and, you know, we kind of hit the, the, the max we could do in that period of time, you know, and yeah. you know, it was like, I need a new, a new objective and a new challenge. And that was, that was helicopters. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, it, it was a very difficult, um, point when Afghanistan ended for a lot of us yeah. because we knew like this this isn't happening again and I had young guys who got in specifically to go to Afghanistan and by the time they made it through the training pipeline and to the regiment we weren't going anymore yeah, and they were they but, were not happy <laughs> yeah. but like as a as a uh, as a contractor where where were you rolling out of yeah so I worked for um, armor group so when I started flying the winters were you know, non-existent for a, for a helicopter pilot in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, so I started working for a, a British firm, a London Armour Group. They no longer exist. But uh, so my first couple uh, winners were in Algeria working for uh, Halliburton Oil mm -hmm. on the rigs. Um, and then when Iraq kicked off, I was up in Fort Nelson, BC flying. They called and said, you, you know, do you want to go to Iraq? And I was like, fuck yeah. Um, you know, but I hadn't, you know, you yeah. So as a young soldier, you're always reading the books. I'd read about Iraq, Iraq Afghanistan, everything. So anyway, so I went over and there we were supporting the, um, the U.S. Department of Defense. We we're doing uh, high profile, low profile stuff. At that time, they were, um, you know, rebuilding Baghdad. So we we're, you know, taking out FLIR contractors to look at the electrical grid, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and then when Afghanistan kicked off, they asked if I was interested in going, but I have to commit for a year. And Armour Group had the British Embassy Foreign Commonwealth Office uh, contract. Right. So we were down in, uh, initially I was in Kabul, but then I was down in Lashkarga in, uh, in Helmand. So we'd go through Bastion, fly down the Schnooks, and then we looked after the, um, the advisor to the governor of Helmand. So we were embedded with uh, Red and Lash. They had their uh, little base PRT there. And it was, initially it was the um, Commando Marines. They did six month tours. Mm -hmm. And then it 
was the para reg for the last six months so we were just in with them and then we we had our little little compound in our vehicles our armors and um yeah their qrf would support us if we got in the shit and yeah, yeah no i was uh, you know for me it was it was an eye opener and you know back to our point is you know as a young soldier that's you know the guys that joined the Canadian military and the regiment to go to Afghanistan. Sometimes you got to be careful what you wish for too. Um, you know, for some people it was it worked out. For other yeah. people, fucking nightmare. Excuse my French. And that's something as an older, you know, guy at that point. You know, my mid mid to late thirties. I was looking at some of the young soldiers coming back from the field, and they just they were not having a good time. And we flew yeah. you know, sang in Garesh, uh, Musa Kala when the Brits were just getting, you know. As everyone else, you know, they were having their yeah challenge lit up down there. Oh yeah, they did not look like no. these. It it they, uh they throw in the wolves, you know, it's it's something. Yeah, it was a, it was a, an eye opener for me. Yeah, yeah. The, the trick is like we all want to do the job, as yeah. as you said earlier, right? Like we all want to to be tested. We want to we we spend so much time training to do something, and now you want to do it. What that usually involves is other people trying to kill you. Yes, for sure. <laughs> and, that's, and they're good uh, at it. And they're good at it. They, um, we recognized pretty early that uh, they were they were targeting the engineers because we were always out in front of everyone. And we looked different. We'd have our metal detectors. We had the, the engineer labs versus the regular labs. And um, it's, it's a whole other ball of wax to realize that they're not just targeting like uh, a uniform or a vehicle. They're, they're coming for you. <laughs> and that's, that's 100%. And, and as I've always said it, I hate to say it, but, you know, being in those environments when you watch and learn and you put yourself in their shoes, you know, mm -hmm. education, religion behind nothing to do with it. Just you as a, as a young man, if someone walked into your neighborhood and started telling you what to do, you would be doing the exact same thing. And I always, it took me a while, but I tried to kind of respect that to a certain extent, you know, because it's, it's a tough one and it's, 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 it's repetitive too. Yeah. And well, that in itself is a risk, right? Yeah. That to be able to accept that your enemy or the people that are you're fighting against yeah. are people and yeah. they are um defending their homes or defending their people or defending their way of life or whatever they're believing yeah. um and that, that that humanizes them it makes it harder to do your job and, and they're not uh, dumb just you know just because you know go to the same schooling system they're they know the ground they got the same you know adrenaline yep. rush in their, in their veins that you do they're out to to get some yep. uh, hence hence result you know where we are now yeah no, uh, yes. thing you mentioned was you know and that's it, you know canada as a country we send our young men and women to afghanistan for example so we take these you know young impressionable people that haven't necessarily led a hard life we put them through a training program and you kind of made reference to it you know it's not the hardest of the the basic trainings and mm -hmm. out there and then you send them to an environment like Afghanistan where the Taliban's running around and you got hardened soldiers that have been doing it for a long time that are out to, you know, take your head off, literally. Mm -hmm. We're, you know, we're kind of doing ourselves a disservice. And that was kind of, you know, a, a part of the book is that, you know, the legions old school and in the basic training and all the system, you know, there's that kind of, there's that discipline that can be, can be a bit tough. Mm -hmm. But it's in it's in your best interest as a young soldier. And you're kind of showing them if you're cut out for this. So if you give a young man or woman a hard time during basic, it's not because you're giving them a hard time. You're trying to show them that this is this is nothing. Yeah. But if you're if you're if you're up for it, keep keep going. If you're not, yeah. get out because it's probably in your best interest. And I think honestly, I think that's what General Crab wrote to you know, the small fort on the back there. Um, because he agreed that you know, Western armies were kind of losing the touch when it comes to that. And hence yeah. The PTSD levels that you know soldiers coming back that have suffered they just weren't prepared or you know we're not vetting properly the type of yeah. soldier that should be thrown into that environment you know and I think you know it's it's something that I think it certainly should be looked at if that's what we're going to be doing in the absolutely future. and I mean it 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 in it, it, it uh, in itself that sending your troops to war sending your um, your sons and daughters, your uh, population to a foreign country yeah. that is totally different than anything anybody has ever experienced from your country, regardless of where they come from. Um, and then bringing them back home after 
you know, months and months and months of trauma. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest issue that uh, a lot of personally for me that I had was when I came back, it was a different army, yeah. right? Like you get to Afghanistan and that's how army should work. If you can't do the job, get the fuck out. Period. End of discussion. If you need something, here it is. If, uh, like one of the things I needed was, uh, a soft bag for my C9. So I asked my SQ and they were like, Oh, we don't have any, we don't have any issue to the engineers. And I'm like, okay. And I went to the, <laughs> the infantry section next to me and I'm like, Hey man, you guys got any soft bags? He's like, yeah, man, here's four. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Done. Uh, and then the other part of it is that we, you live the way you're supposed to live, right? Everyone on your side will take a round for anyone on your side. Just being in that uniform affords you that uh, ability, but it, it alleviates so much stress from the general judgment of how, as a human, you try to uh, judge and determine how somebody else is going to react in any interaction with you. That guy's in uniform. I may hate his guts, but I'd still take a bullet for him in a heartbeat. Doesn't matter, right? And that is a, uh, it's one of the major challenges that I found when I came home was that is gone. And then you have to deal with the administrators and you have to deal with the, uh, uh, the lack of general support and everyone trying to be hard still. And, and of course, we're all young. We don't know any fucking better, right? And we're just like, eh, let's go. <laughs> let's go back to war. It's so much easier there. Um, so that, you know, it plays a part of it. And you're right in that if you don't train up hard, it, it, it just gets harder. Right? Like from yeah. from basic to your trades training to uh, your unit to actual combat it just keeps getting harder and if you're not up to par then you shouldn't be there and it is a uh, but that is the wartime army peacetime army that's the difference you know and you yeah. you see that in the you know you're downrange your counterparts the guys you're working with they're they're there for a reason they want to be there you know mm -hmm. the ncos the officers that are rising to the top they're downrange type individuals that are out there working with you proving and it's it's a whole different environment you go back to base and the rear epsilon world is totally different different yeah. reality, reality and that's and then i think when we come home from those type of environments and we're amongst civilians that don't really understand or grasp the things that you've experienced or seen you can't explain that to them um, there, there's no way and if you tried they just you know you, they get that glazed look over and they're like whatever you know they don't understand yeah. i think the only thing you can really do is just you know yourself you know your limits and what you've and then just try to circumnavigate that civilian world mm -hmm. and use the tools that you've learned for your own good and let the civvies do what the yeah city. i've uh i came to realize very early on that uh the best way to describe it to civilians is to give them context, right? That's the biggest thing they're missing. They don't have the context. I mean, you knowing what Helmand is like, Helmand and Kandahar are pretty similar. I can say, you know, do you remember the dust? And you'll be like, <laughs> yep, no problem. The average person doesn't understand that. You can say that there's dust on stuff. You can say that it's everywhere. You can say that it's like talcum powder, but they don't have the context to really understand that, but they I, can. I in that it's what was it, sixty percent fecal matter in Kabul? What was the <laughs> that gets her attention? Yeah, <clears throat> that was. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, getting flashbacks now. <laughs> the smell. The uh, yeah. Um, I just I I remember talking to uh, you know other people who have been there, and you can say, you know, it was hot that day, and you can you know you you understand what it was like when it was hot the average civilian knows that hot is well the average canadian citizen knows that hot is like 30 degrees right and that's hot for them okay they can't conceptualize what 60 degree weather is like and there's no other way to say it when people would ask me what afghanistan was like when i came home i was like it was hot it was dusty right like they don't they they can't the trick is to understand that they can empathize though right yeah. you can you can describe it in such a way that it doesn't require all the build up and all the context and you you can say it's hot it was really hot plus i was wearing 200 pounds of gear and we were walking around all day and it sucked okay well the average person knows 
what things like what it feels like to have things suck they just don't know what it is to the extent that we are at and i think that's a we have to accept the the risk of boring someone or them not quite understanding or not having the, the proper context of that but we still need to talk about it. i think that's the one thing that we've neglected as a society is that we we don't share our experiences very often you, you know people write books and yeah. but it's still a rarity you we have some major officers that will write books about their experiences but it's from a strategic level and you know it's not on yeah. the ground i mean your book was on the ground right this is what it was like for me and we need more people sharing their experiences in that manner but it is such a risk because you are you're, you're laying it all out there right yeah for sure yeah and, no, uh, yeah the old ego can be you know i um <clears throat> sometimes when people ask about afghanistan i you know i'm not in the mood i'll just say you know i had i had this he was a 16 year old uh um pakistani boy that made us kind of got down and he took a run at us with his suicide vest mm -hmm. afghan army suit on and i remember i just thought you know that that's the mentality that they're they're willing to to put into this and how do you fathom that as a Canadian? If I tell someone in Canada that you know, a 16 year old boy was willing to strap a vest on and, and walk up and blow himself up for his cause, you know, yep. it's just, it just blows people's mind, right? And it kind of shuts the, the conversation down. If And uh, another one too, is I took my son to, uh, to say he's just turning 16. Remember 1914 came out? Mm -hmm. Where the First World War. And, Nin uh, 1918? Yeah, sorry. 19, yep. the, and uh, yeah, I said to him, he, he said, you know, is this real? I told him, you know, it was IMAX. <clears throat> oh, wow. Was this real? And I said, yeah. And some of those kids lied about their ages and they were your age. Mm -hmm. Or younger. And, yeah. I remember he was just like, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like, yeah. Dumb. Yeah, it's, I, yeah, it's, I think sharing some of this stuff is, you know, important in our, in our history that, uh, cause we seem to make the same mistakes all the time, you know, we'll oh, yeah. be in another Afghanistan here in 10 years or whatever it's going to be. And it will just be a re learning experience, a learning curve again. And we just forget, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. I was, I was talking to some, uh, some Yanks. I don't know if you ever, if you get a chance to listen to it, it's called the Panchway podcast. Okay. Uh, it's a couple of Americans that were there in 2012. So after we had already pulled out and they were in uh, Spurungar okay. and, uh, they were learning the same things that we had learned at the beginning of the war, just because strategies had fallen back on themselves. Yeah. So at the beginning, when we first went in, you know, gunfights were a pretty regular thing. Um, wasn't such a big IED threat. So they were engaging pretty much directly. When I got there, IEDs were a much bigger issue, uh, but we were still using the roads and we were still using the pathways and we were just constantly checking them. And then, um, and then the, when the Americans came in, after us, they were getting into gunfights more often. So they were doing gunfighter stuff. And then they, the IED threat started to come up and the gunfights started to go down. Like it was just start the, all over. You start all over and the tactics fall back on each other and so on and so forth. But I always wonder why NATO didn't hire ex Russian generals to come <laughs> in and assault. You know what I mean? They spent a decade there. They had it, they didn't, they weren't successful. Good luck, yeah. NATO. The Russians yeah. were. And then perfect example is, you know, I used to, we used to fly down one of our early contracts. We were out of Kabul. We had a, um, it was that South African uh, C-130 that was painted up UN colors. Mm -hmm. it, we were, we were uh, flying around the British um, narcotics police and they were mentoring the Afghans. So we'd fly down to all these different uh, cities with our armors and go out. And anyway, at every airport, there's Russian, as you saw, aircraft everywhere on the side of the runways and stuff. Mm -hmm. And used to you know mine them and or drive vehicles out the last moment when the aircraft were and when we were down in lash they had um the airstrip for the uh the raf was outside of the town so whenever there was a hurt coming down the raf regiment would drive out secure the airstrip the surroundings and then in comes this c-130 and i remember they had a brand new j model c-130 it and it came and hit a mine and within a minute there was nothing left but the tail yeah, I don't know how much, but you know what I mean. I was like, "Fuck!" They did this. We're like, "Hello," you know. I, mean, I just remember shaking my head. That's to your point. You know, it's just the learning curve was a start over and the handover. You don't yeah. want to ask. It's like an ego yeah. thing. No, we know how to do this. We're Anyways. one of the one of the tricks that uh, I got taught very early was the uh, when we were doing booby trap training. They were like, "How would you kill you?" 
like with all of my training as an engineer, how would you kill another engineer? And that just that one statement helped me immensely in Afghanistan because it was like, that's a, that's exact. This is where I would put a mine. If I was coming through here, this is where I would do it. Um, and just the ability to understand that like totally changed how I interacted with the environment out there. Right. And uh, to your point, what you were saying earlier was that this came from training hard, realistic training. You are then one of the things my Sergeant told me when we first got there was it's not a question of if we get blown up, it's a question of when and how bad. And that's it. So. When I was in Iraq, same thing, obviously IADs were rampant. And when I was, I was a TL for a, we were a mobile PSD team. So we had uh, four 350 armored trucks actually built in Canada. Mm -hmm. It'd be three vehicle moves. And I would say to my guys all the time, because there's choke points everywhere, same thing. We have to be on the ball when it comes to our taxes and where we position ourselves, especially on, on corners, choke points, because it's not when, as you said, it's, or sorry, it's not if, it's, it's when. when yeah. If we're positioned properly, hopefully the armored will do its do its tool or its job. If we're right in on the corner where they're going to dig it in because they know you're turning sharp on that corner, you know, you're going to pay the price. And we did, we paid the price, but getting that across and then especially with long tours as you guys would have, you start to get complacent and lazy, especially if things have been quiet mm -hmm. and they're good at taking advantage of complacency. They, they watch, they see where you're cutting corners or where you're getting lazy and then they, they pounce, right? Yep. Yeah. Was, and they, and they, not only that, but they, they target the tactics that you're using, yeah. right? So you have to be able to not only, even if you're on the ball, if you're using the same tactic over and over again, come that's what they're going to come at you with. And that was one of the, one of the things I wanted to talk about too, was the, the ability to adjust, right? That, that is a huge risk in, in life because if you're comfortable, it's nice, right? It's nice to be comfortable. You have a, you got a good job, you got a house, you got a family, life's pretty chill, you know, whatever. And then a pandemic hits and you're not working anymore and you don't have the house and, or you have the house, but you're still paying mortgage and like anything can happen. Anything can happen. And the, uh, the ability to adjust or just, you know, look at something and go, okay, well, this isn't working. How do I do something else? in your experiences were like, when did you learn that? <laughs> Cause that, that I've for me, it was late, that. but <laughs> I'm still learning. Yeah. And that's what I say to my kids too. So I said, you never stop learning about yourself. You know, this is, don't think you're going to have it figured out because we all think at 25, oh, I, I know what, you know, I got it. I got it down. You don't at 35, you don't at 45, you, you're getting better, but you don't, you know, it's, um, I think, to answer your question, when shit goes wrong or there's a change and it's stressful, um, again, back to what we said earlier is, is kind of not looking at it pinpoint, but just the big picture and yeah. trying to, you know, be a little more uh, patient and, um, you know, less reactive and not, you know, stress out about something. Just, you know what? Shit happens. You know you're capable of dealing with it. Just keep pushing forward, stick to your guns, and you will get through that moment. Yeah. Or whatever, you know what I mean? And that easier said than done. And I, you know, I screw up all the time and I got to reset. Sometimes I have debriefs with my kids where we're on the road and, you know, I've been cut off by an idiot and I lose my shit. And then I pull over and say, you know what, kids? That was probably not the best way to deal with something, you know? Um, <laughs> So that's such always, a great lesson though. Oh yeah. Right. So it's yeah. You're able to debrief you. I think that's a big thing too in life is you're able to debrief yourself and then try to try to work on things and adjust, you know, as things happen or if there's that repetitive error or things that are popping up all the time, you can try to find that, that way around it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's, you're going from up armored to fully armored to going to low profile to you're always trying to, you know, get around the risks, but it's always there. Yeah. So, it's always there. That's a great way to do great way to put it. Um, so we've been rolling for just a bit over an hour now. Do you have any uh, final points, any final thoughts on risk? No, I think, um, yeah, to tie up, as you say, it's always there. Um, it's learning to deal with it, mm -hmm. finding your comfort levels and learning from. Um, clearly, 
you want to try to mitigate risk as best you can. You're never going to negate it, but mm -hmm. uh, that's up to you and your in your path on how risky you want to go. And uh, it has its pros and cons, you know. Yeah, that it does. So if anybody wants to um, follow you, know more about you, get your book, for example, how would they do that? Um, so yeah, I'm on, I'm not a huge social media type, but I'm on, you know, Facebook, more, more Instagram at Joel Struthers. Um, the book is on Amazon. You could DM me if you want for a, a signed copy. Um, but it's on Amazon. It's audible. Uh, it's on Apple, Google play for the, the audio books. Um, and then all my proceeds go to Legion engineered, which is a, uh, a charitable effort to try to generate funds to to maybe help fix some of the uh, our small town memorials and cenotaphs that that need some of the upkeep out there. So it's just a, a way of you know making this this book do something for the good. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's about it. LinkedIn on a professional side, you know, right. I'm a partner at, and uh, at Raven Hill Risk Control. Um, so yeah, I'm on LinkedIn for for that at Joel Struthers. Awesome. Well, again, I I can't thank you enough, brother, for being on here. This has awesome. been an absolutely fantastic conversation and uh i think we've there's quite a bit for people to be able to pick pick their pieces out of this it's just yeah, been also, yeah it's good on you for what you're doing keep it up it's uh it's good to have different uh yeah things to listen to and, and hear other experiences you know absolutely well i get to sit in my basement and talk to people so <laughs> it's pretty good for me all right thanks brother bet keep safe that concludes this episode of The Toolbox. I want to thank you for listening. I hope you were able to use some of the information that was offered. I want to thank all those putting it on the line for us every day. Military, veterans, first responders, and public servants. Keep up the good work. I look forward to bringing you more tools for your toolbox. And until next time, stay open, stay humble, and stay focused. Chimo.